I think that understanding that pain and pleasure are in this really dynamic balance can also help us which in the following way. Any pain that you feel, the longer day, the less sleep, the, the kind of agony that things aren't working, that power outlet doesn't work, or the internet is slow, whatever it is, the amount of pleasure that you will eventually experience is directly relation, related, excuse me, to how much pain you experience. So we know this from actually what nowadays would be considered quite barbaric and unethical experiments where they would give people electrical shocks and they would measure their response and then they say, we're gonna increase it, we're gonna increase it. Eventually they get to the point where a slight a shock that was previously very painful actually evokes a sense of pleasure. <laughs> now you couldn't do these experiments anymore. These are not the experiments I do in my lab. These are older experiments. But for instance, uh, and this has been discussed in scientific research papers, uh, giving somebody a, like a, a 10 minute ice bath, for instance, or even a three minute ice bath, or a one minute ice bath, it's quite painful. But there was a study from University of Prague a European Journal of Physiology showed that after a painful ice bath stimulus, the amount of dopamine release goes up for two and a half hours to 250% above baseline. And that's not because the ice bath itself evokes dopamine release. A lot of people think, oh, cold water evokes dopamine release. No, pain evokes <laughs> dopamine release after the pain is over. Yesterday, I tweaked my back because I do this stupid thing every few years, the same stupid thing, and it, it's really painful. And then you just remember all the ways in which you can't move around. I was like standing up this morning, I'm like, ah, uh, and just walking is so painful. As the pain has started to dissipate, you get a little bit of a high, right? You get a little bit of a euphoria, that's dopamine because of the, the degree of pain that you experienced previously predicts how much pleasure. So when you start a company down in the dregs and you're shoveling again, that's beautiful because that means that the win that you achieve is going to be as good or greater than the one you had previously, in your case with Quest. And so we go back to this example of the person that's not motivated, that can't get off the couch, that doesn't want to do anything. Well, this is the problem. We Remember the rat experiment? They are effectively the rat with no dopamine, but they can still achieve some sense of pleasure by consuming excess calories by consuming social media. And look, I'm not judging, I do this stuff too, right? Scrolling social media. If you've ever scrolled social media and you're like, I don't even know why I'm doing this. It doesn't really feel that good. And I can remember a time where you'd see something that was just so cool, or you'd see something online. I remember this when TED Talks first came out. I was like, this is amazing. These are some, you know, at least some of them are really smart people sharing really cool insights. And then now that they're like a gazillion TED Talks, I remember spending a winter in my office at when I was a junior professor cleaning my office finally and binging TED Talks in the background thinking this is a good use of my time. Pretty soon, they all sucked to me. <laughs> I was like, this isn't good. So what you need to do is stop watching TED Talks for a while, wait, and then they become interesting again. And that's this pain pleasure balance. And so for people that aren't feeling motivated, the problem is they're not motivated, but they're getting just enough or excess sustenance. So they're getting the little mild hits of opio, it becomes an opioid system. And if you think about the opioid drugs as opposed to dopamine, dopaminergic drugs, dopaminergic drugs make people rabid for everything. You know, drugs of abuse like cocaine and amphetamine make people incredibly outward directed, right? They hardly notice anything except what they want more of, more, 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 more. It's very, it's bad because those drugs trigger so much dopamine release that they become the reward. It's very circular. The, only the drug can give that much dopamine. Nothing they could pursue would give them as much dopamine as the drug itself. So. There's that, and then there's the kind of opioid-like effects of constantly indulging oneself with social media or with video games or with, uh, with food or with anything to the point where it no longer evokes the motivation and craving. And this is really the new evolution of the understanding of, of dopamine in, neuro, in neuroscience, which is that dopamine itself is not the reward. It's the buildup to the reward. And the reward has more of a kind of opioid bliss-like property, which itself is not bad, if it's endogenous, released from within. But when we can just sit there like the, like the rat with no dopamine, gorging ourselves with pleasures, so to speak, what you end up with is somebody that feels really unmotivated and those pleasures no longer work to tickle those feel-good circuits. And so there's no reason for them to go out and pursue anything. And that's a pretty dark picture. So the, the keys are to pursue rewards, but understand that the pursuit is actually the reward if you want to have repeated wins. Okay, you, the celebration has to be less than the pursuit. And that's hard for some people to do. 
They, you know, they, it's got to be that your celebration is slightly less dopaminergic. It can be very reflective. You can be in gratitude. Those are other neurotransmitter systems, but you don't want to be on that high as you celebrate the win. You want to be trickling out your dopamine regularly until you pursue things. And then just understand there will always be a crash of pain. And the more pain you experience, the more dopamine you can achieve if you get back on the avenue of pursuit.